Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here this afternoon. Uh, I will talk to you about uh, my work and my passion in the development world and the fight uh, in reducing poverty in the world. So before, before doing that, I will give you a quick background of myself. If it works. Okay, I started as an entrepreneur in the private sector and uh, at the age of uh, 23 as a brand manager and then I moved into entrepreneurship. Um, and um, after that, uh, I don't know, it's not working. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Looks it's working. So I started as a brand manager, as I said, and I, I was in the watch business, uh, where we, we did fantastic, nice, thematic watches uh, for a certain type of market. Uh, they were done in France, in Besançon. Besançon for 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 you guys is used to be the capital city of uh, French orology. Um, so it went on for some time and then I moved to China. Uh, again, as an entrepreneur, I uh, worked there uh, in Pret-à-Porter, I know, and uh, increased in the same time uh, the my experience in marketing and sales. Uh, this is there also where I met my, my wife who was working at the time uh, in the uh, development world and I saw in her an ideal to follow. And she encouraged me to get into this world. And together, after this, we moved in uh, Ethiopia, uh, where I was. I started my, my work for a specialized UN agency. It's called UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And we were looking at the upgrading of the whole leather industry of Ethiopia. After Ethiopia, then I moved to Vienna at the headquarters, where I managed projects uh, related to, of course, poverty reduction, but in the area of entrepreneurship. Um, creative industries, vocational training, and diversification of livelihood. So, this is to say that uh, UNIDO uh, is a really very specialized agency whose work is in three thematic areas. Poverty reduction through productive activities, trade and capacity building, and energy and environment. Uh, UNIDO aspires to reduce poverty through inclusive and sustainable industrial development. And this is what we do. My work is mainly in the poverty eradication part through productive activities. So before going ahead, why creativity? Uh, in order to understand why creativity for development, you need to understand creativity as a definition. And I like that definition of Sir Ken Robinson in one uh, TED talk, probably most of you have seen, where he says that uh, Creativity is a process, and from the interaction of it, a uh, valuable idea can, can sparkle. And it's a different uh, disciplinary ways in seeing things, and this is exactly what we do. This is exactly how we tackle the challenges. We looked at the problem in, dis in a various and disciplinary way. Uh, like, for example, here you have a value chain, the cotton value chain. Uh, most of you know the clothes, but it goes from the harvest, post-harvest, all the mechanization, uh, the skills design, marketing, and distribution. And we need to look at the whole value chain and understand it in order to bring in solutions that are, uh, well, that are effective for, uh, and, and meaningful for, for the populations. When you are working in entrepreneurship for development, for uh, the solution uh, to social problem to happen, uh, your, the business model that you are drawing people in have to be sustainable. This is very important. This is why we aim at a bottom-out approach uh, in creating a creative ecosystem and prag pragmatically align uh, the, the, the services towards the demand. So basically, what we intend with creative ecosystem? Basically, we root our approach in the specificities of the territories. The territories come with their own cultural heritage, their own specific skills. We don't need to invent anything. Everything is there. It just needs to be revealed. We connect these territories through the value chains, as you saw, um, with the vocational training sector, with the academic sector for R&D, with the private sector. Because 
these communities, most of the time, they cannot access the market, but formalized private sector operators can. So we need to connect them, and this system works. Once the system has started working, then public policy can come in and create an enabling environment. And once you have this enabling environment through legal and social policies, then you have finance inflowing in the territories. And like this, you have created an ecosystem that is absolutely sustainable. And what about the alignment? What about not looking at projects that pushes products to the market, but looks at the possibilities of the market, the demand, the segmentation, and then comes in the, uh, to, to, to the uh, design diagnostic, a 360 degrees design diagnostic, where you look at all the processes needed to achieve that goal. So meaning that you have to look at the human skills, you have to look at the production, the finance, the product development, the quality, uh, supply chain, marketing and sales. It's really a pragmatic approach or the value chain approach. Here I will bring you two examples, one in Pakistan and then in Madagascar. In Pakistan we worked for, uh, in a project of um, achieving gender parity in highly uh, not traditional sectors where we worked in three value chains, the marble sector, the textile sector and the gems and jewelry sector. So what does it look like? Actually, it's highly non-traditional for women because this is how the value chain of marble looks like. You have the quarry and then from the quarry you have regular blocks, irregular blocks and from that you have always marble waste, like tons of waste and marble slabs, marble products, and marble tiles, which all in the process generate even more waste. And this is where creativity comes in. This is where we enter in because those segments of waste can be cut in pixels, and those pixels can become mosaics and inlays. And to do that, you need those skills. That's why it's important to connect with the vocational training, because those skills, you can formalize them and then spread them in the whole country. And that's why you need designing. Uh, so that's why you need to connect with the um, R&D and design centers, because design like this can, I mean, brain can flow in uh, the sector. And those products, then you have a different type of products. You have tumbled mosaics, computerized mosaics, Tessere, etc., etc. You need to connect with the formalized private sector because the marble operators already have connections with the market and they can connect this end product directly with the consumer. And as you can see, we were first in a sector that was aiming at the building market. And after applying some creative mind on that, we were targeting the home decoration market with a highly much higher value addition. Now, when we are there, then we need to ask what is design? Is this design? I would say so. It's design, right? And what is creativity for these populations? You know, this is also creativity. Your car, yeah, have been <laughs> watched by satellite, and this guy is satellite. So, uh, it's very interesting to see also what is the meaning of industrialization, you know? This is recycling and industrialization. Very handy barbecue. So in order to do that, we need to set some tools for creation. We need to sell tools uh, by, by doing ethnograph uh, ethnographic observation, image banks. We need to listen to the stories and have the story told. This means that, for example, in the case of Pakistan, we went in the museums and took stock of all the pictures, patterns, uh, through the ages. The, the Pakistani culture is tremendously and, and greatly uh, various and, uh, and rich. So we brought this free, of course, uh, to all creators. If, any, if nobody can access uh, inspiration, they cannot create. So uh, this image bank then uh, was divided in thematic areas they can go in different periods and this is how then we come in with the industrial design yes we bring in industrial designers to impart their knowledge of how to interpret small things that for you and me probably doesn't mean anything but for them is the source of inspiration so here you have a petroglyph that becomes a pattern so they have an iconog uh, iconographic study on that and this pattern becomes colors and this colors becomes a work on ceramic and the ceramic becomes your coffee cup. 
Some other examples. How to route inspiration to the territory. Here uh, we are in Brasilia. It's a bridge, fam a very famous bridge in Brasilia. And the designer was asked to connect uh, Brasilia's uh, product, uh, of course, to the territory. So how you can grasp inspiration from that? This becomes, again, an icon, coloring. And this becomes a textile and becomes pillows. And as you can see, the interpretation of this pattern becomes something very contemporary and, and I would say, nice to buy. Again, another seamless uh, structure, uh, the Presidential Palace of Brasilia, the first one. Again, becomes a pattern, a work on the patterns, and this becomes ceramics. You have in then the skills. Does this population have the right skill? And you saw that you need to impart those skills along with entrepreneurship uh, mind th mindset in order to, uh, to have those women entering the market. Those women were educated at some point and they, uh, you know, they got married, they had kids and they stood home. And the kids grow up at some point and they started to wanting to, to become active again. And this is how the project uh, started with those women trying to get in the market. We taught them how to interpret their own cultural heritage in a way that they can do this type of products. As you can see, this comes from the Pakistani culture and yet it was very interpreted in a very designy way. And there again. And here we are in the gems and jewelry. The gems and jewelry again was uh, working on the uh, we were working on the rejects of the, these gemstones using a technique that is called the wire wrapping techniques with semi-precious and precious metal. So it's gold, silver or, or copper. And again, the inspiration is the own uh, culture of Pakistan interpreted in a design way by these ladies. As, as you can see, these are very contemporary products. Now let's travel to Madagascar. Madagascar is another project that looks at uh, extreme poverty for women. We are in Farafangana. We are two days and a half by car from the capital city of Antanarivo. And this is the location, beautiful but very simple. We are, we are talking of population that are living under $1.25 a day, even less than that. Their, their main asset, I put here the skills, but their main asset is their spirit a great spirit, and they know how to weave baskets. And, uh, and we have also metal work there. So what we do is we directed their skill for a different purpose. So we help them do furniture. And this furniture had a target market, the, um, the industry in the area, the leisure industry in the area, the hotels in the region. And these ladies started working together, and these products sold massively. Again, another product. Doesn't seem that it was done far, far away. And again. These are the faces, because all the time we talk of uh, uh, poverty and crisis, you have always these faces that are always smiling. It's something that strikes me all the time when, we, when, I, when I do, in my line of work, we have people smiling uh, and doing uh, and, and wanting to, to get up. And this is our main challenge in helping them getting out of this uh, situation and standing on their own feet, regaining their dignity, having those smiles more and more. So to wrap up, uh, creativity for development, as I said, is a process, an interactive process. This simply means that you cannot stay in your own element and be comfortable within. Uh, and tackling poverty by reaching out to people's creativity is a sustainable way because it is limitless based upon uh, diversity of talent and you need to do so by bringing on the table your own creativity. Be curious. Look around you, uh, because one day that seemingly not important detail will make a difference for someone. And this is from my experience. And I wanted to end my presentation with this quote. Overcoming poverty is not a task of charity, it is an act of justice. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. 
It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by human beings' action. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. You can be the generation. Let your greatness blossom. Thank you very much. <laughs>